So good morning. Good morning. Are we on? Yes. Good morning, and uh, welcome once again to worship here from uh, St. Andrew St. Stephen's Presbyterian Church in uh, North Vancouver. I love that song. Uh, leading into our service this morning, nothing uh, else can satisfy. Like, that's really the message. That's what we want to come together uh, to really focus on that, to feed our souls, for us to come before God this morning and at the beginning of another new week and say, this is where we need to begin. We need to begin with you. So uh, welcome uh, wherever you are in your worship spaces this morning uh, for this time that we have together. And as we do every Sunday morning, I invite you to light a candle in those worship spaces to remind you that we are together uh, in United and worship, but we are in the presence of God. Uh, the light of the world is in our midst. So how about we light those candles right now? Daniel, would you come and lead us in our worship this morning? I go to the with my mouth now. Good morning. Whoa. Good morning. Coming to two mics, I think. My only one mic. I'm just a loud Chilean. Sorry if you are at home. Um, you probably didn't get that, but it, it was heard very loud in here. Uh, and we don't have that many people in the building. Actually, it's just Owen, Martin, Pam, and I. So I'm going to read from, from Luke 5, um, 15, and, and so on. Uh, so yet the news about Jesus spread all the more. So that crowds of people come, came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But often Jesus withdrew to lonely places and prayed. So news about Jesus spread around fast. Of course, right? In the tiny villages of Galilee, there was a special teacher, a special rabbi, who was able to open the eyes of the blind, clean leprosy with a simple touch, and hit hard like, like a one person with authority, not like the teachers of the time. So people sought him, wanted to see him, wanted to hear from him, wanted to touch him. So in one occasion, we read in the gospel that after a solitary time of prayer, the disciples told him, everyone is looking for you. And Jesus was aware of all of that. He knew he had a lot of work to do when he was around the villages in Galilee. Everyone was looking for him. However, he found time to be alone with God. Because one thing was crystal clear to him, he needed to stop. He understood the significance of spending time alone in prayer with the Father. He had something, he had something that all contemporary world lacks, discipline. We lack discipline. So in this time or in this time of land, as we are traveling and journeying through the gospel of Luke, let's remember this Jesus. Because we do have busy lives, busy schedules, tons of appointments, work classes, sports, and so on. And sometimes we are sort of addicted to be busy. And this pandemic has seemed to increase this notion of being always connected. It's, it's, it's strange, right? Because we don't see each other physically, but somehow we manage to be always connected through the digital world. 
I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel that I've been all day in the computer. And when I let the computer go, I'm in the phone. And yes, I also have an iPad, my bad. So we are constantly connected. So we need to ask one question in this time. What is it in our heart that we need to be constantly connected? constantly busy. We often assume that we need discipline to organize our time, but we forget that we also need discipline to stop running, to set time apart to be with God. So let's use this land season to spare some time, to spend with God, to disconnect to use this time, to think about this time as a time in the desert with God. And I was speaking with the youth on Friday and I, I was, we, we shared some ideas about Lent and I, I, we were talking and somehow this year has, has felt like a time in the desert, right? And so uh, some of them, we're like, are, are you kidding me? You want me to spend time alone after a year of being isolate, isolated? Um, well, if you put it like that, uh, that's not what I meant. What I meant is, why don't we spend some time with God in this time? That's not time alone. That's time with the one person who really, really loves you. So let's pray. Let's pray. Dear God, we come to you on this Sunday, the first Sunday of Lent. And we ask you that during this Lent season, you give us the strength and more importantly, the discipline to set time apart, to reflect, to think about the gift of life that your son's sacrifice and resurrection has provided us with. Help us to deepen our understanding of what it means to follow you in these crazy times. So as we come to you today from different places, whether we are with our families or we are alone, we ask you that wherever we are, you help us to have a worship space in our homes. So our places become a worship altar to be with you this morning. Speak to us through your word, open through your word, open our hearts your word of, to your word of life, your word that gives life, that nourishes our lives, your word that renews your life in us. After a long season of pandemic, that seems like a time of exile. We need your word. We need your spirit to renew our strength, to renew our lives. So we ask you that you speak to us today. Open our hearts and we pray for all we do today. In your name, amen. Thanks, Daniel, for uh, leading us this morning. Uh, Monday, uh, family day, I was on Mount Seymour with the girls, and uh, what a privilege that was. And uh, uh, the Walton Knights were there, and uh, what a what a joy that is uh, to be able to ski and be kind of roughly together. Uh, but one of the things that I enjoy about uh, skiing with the Walton Knights is uh, when you're standing in a lineup with Nicola, she had a she always has a tendency to hum or sing. And last Monday, this song uh, was constantly kind of playing uh, on the mountain. I'll not tell you the song that Matthew was constantly uh, singing because that's stuck in my head all week as well. But uh, this one that Nicola was singing has been with me all week. And the lyrics just seem to um, 
really connect with where, I'm, uh, where we're at in our journey in Luke. And so this morning, I'm going to invite you in your worship spaces to sing uh, this incredible song of praise. It's called Come Thou Fount. Over to you, Owen. Great song, great song. Uh, thank you, Nicola, for inspiring me all week uh, with the words of that song in my head. A couple of quick announcements before we uh, switch to the prayers of the people. Uh, hopefully you're getting your daily devotionals by email uh, that have been getting sent out to you from last Wednesday. So we are, what, what, five days into it now? You should have received five. And I hope that you're enjoying them. I hope they're blessing you as much as they're blessing me. So say, I, I didn't get to read any of them before uh, they're emailed out. And I've just been blown away by the five that we've received thus far. So uh, if you're not getting the daily devotionals, drop Ange an email and she will add your email address to the, uh, the list at the beginning of the week and make sure that you continue to get blessed as we journey through Lent, receiving a daily devotional written by someone within our own community of faith or a kind of honorary member, a friend, close friend of, of our church family. Wednesday night, we're continuing our uh, reflection uh, series, short reflection series, 7.30 to 8 o'clock, working through the letters to the churches in Asia Minor, Revelation chapters 2 and 3. Uh, we're at letter number two this coming Wednesday, which will be the letter to the church in Smyrna. Um, I, I hope uh, it, it, that uh, you'll join in for that. It was, uh, well, I hope it was a good evening last Wednesday night, a good time to focus and reflect. Um, it, it's not an occasion really to interact. We're doing it in 30 minutes. It really is a, a chance for you to come and uh, reflect. Uh, I will lead you in a time of uh, prayer um, when you can personally reflect and pray um, of what the letter is actually saying to you. Uh, Wednesday, uh, oh, Thursday morning, sorry, Bible study continues at 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, Daniel is taking uh, the Bible study through the letters of 
uh, of John, first, second, third John. So um, I think there's a couple of weeks into that, but um, he, he would love to see more people involved in those. So um, again, it's just the usual Zoom connection into it um, from 10 to 11.30. And last, but by no means least, annual report. Uh, we've mentioned this in a few weeks now over the uh, newsletters and emails. Um, if you are in charge of a ministry in the church, and I realize from middle of last March, we haven't been doing really anything within the building, but there were still two and a half months at the beginning of the year, and God willing, uh, your ministry, our ministries, will start up again before the end of this calendar year. So it will be an opportunity just to drop even a little short paragraph um, that we will pull together and get it sent out uh, about what, uh, what's been going on. So I really encourage you, if you are in charge of any ministry team, get those annual reports uh, by email into Ange this week as we will be trying to pull, start pulling things together uh, with the plan to have an annual meeting uh, sometime uh, mid-March, all right? That would be great. Now, with those quick announcements, I'm going to invite uh, Pam, and she's going to come and lead us in prayer. Good morning, church family. Let's pray. Loving Father, you are worthy of all praise. You are the God who never fails to keep his promises. We thank you that in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, we see your love. Father, during this Lent season, nourish us with your word of life and make us one in your spirit. Fill our hearts with your love and keep us faithful to the gospel of Christ. You are God who lifts up those who are weighed down. You are the God who always provides for your children. Trusting in that promise, we come to you today, leaving all our problems, sickness, and concerns in your hands. We lift up our prayers for all those suffering in Texas. We pray for your mighty hand to quickly solve the water and electrical problems. You are a powerful and loving God. So we come before you to comfort the people in Texas who have lost their homes and they are struggling to find a new place to live or make repairs to their homes. Living Father, you are a God of new life. So we ask you today a special blessing on baby Smith. Bless his parents, Crystal and Cordelia, and his siblings, Nathan and Amy. We rejoice with them as they wait patiently the arrival of the new baby boy. Put your protective hand on him and make Orlea feel the love of her church family as she carries her baby for the last few months. We continue to lift prayers for Helen Arnett, Isla Robertson, Ron Edwards, David Valentine, Liz Lilly, Lauren Dennis, Don Campbell, Margaret Williams, Kel Kaiser, Penny McDonald, Alan Bone, Joanne Graham, Dean Scott, Erna Buchman, Len Fury. Oh Lord, we be the doctor they need, be the family member they miss. God, we keep asking how long will this pandemic last? We are surrounded on all sides by our enemies, fear, despair, anger, and grief. Our plans are crushed or postponed until further notice. Our companions have become images and voices on screens. This invisible terror is all the hugs of loved ones, the companionship of friends, and added the constant panic of raising numbers of cases. But then we proclaim that you are our shield and our strong power. You are the lifter of our heads and the light that makes our way clear. We take small steps holding your hand. We cannot hold the hands of others yet, 
but we can hold each other in loving prayer, walking together with courage the way before us, as you, our enemies fall by, one by one until life breathes easy again. Then, like eagles, we will soar. We will join the joyful praises of those who go to your holy house and lift the roof with hallelujahs. We ask you to help our kids and youth. This time has not been easy on them. They do struggle in different ways. We trust you will be their companion, their friend. In times of despair or isolation, we ask you to shine your light and make them understand that this is only temporary. Father God, we humbly bow before you today as your people who are built from many different cultures, different histories, different experiences. So we take time this month to recognize the important contributions of the African-American community. Help us to build our country in your foundation with compassion and justice. We ask you that every day you remind us to love one another to do to others as we would have done unto ourselves. Teach us, loving Father, to love one another despite our differences and to embrace our diversity, for in our diversity there is greatness. So together we pray for our brothers and sisters who are suffer and are affected by racial discrimination and injustice, especially members of the Black community and First Nations. May we unite in prayer so that the Spirit of the Lord can help us find true healing and renewal. Dear Lord, make us the best example that our children want to follow so they can see in us kindness, love, forgiveness, patience, justice, and the life that Jesus wants us to live. Jesus, Every good and perfect gift is a blessing from you and you have blessed us with so much. We ask that you will use us to be a blessing to others who are in need or facing difficulties. Make us a channel of your blessing, a channel through whom your love, peace and joy flow out from you through us to others. May we be your hands to bless others. May you guide our feet to places where we can go and be a blessing. Give us the grace to be available when others are in need. Lord, we pray that in this Lent season, you may increase in our lives and we may decrease so that the blessings that you pour through us to others may draw each other closer into the arms of the Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pam, for uh, leading us in prayer this morning. Um, what a blessing uh, you continue to be uh, week after week um, to us and your involvement in these services. Uh, our reading this morning is we're continuing our journey through Luke's gospel. So if you get your Bibles out and turn to Luke chapter 7, we're going to uh, be reading from the beginning of Luke chapter 7. And we're going to Jamie uh, online. She should be there and she's going to be reading for us. Morning, Jamie. Morning, everyone. Good morning. Great to see you. Uh, last time I saw you, you had kind of like couldn't recognize you've got a ski hat on and all that yeah. sort of stuff. So great to see your face this morning. Uh, but uh, enough of that. And Jamie, would you uh, read for us? Absolutely. Uh, everyone, the reading this morning is from Luke chapter 7, verses 1 to 17. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There, a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. 
He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had sent, who had been sent, returned to the house and found the servant well. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. Then he went up and touched the buyer they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God, a great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. This is the word of the Lord. For reading uh, our lesson this morning. Uh, one of the songs that um, has really been, uh, I hear it a lot, actually, not only in Praise 106.5, but uh, in some shops, like even being in Old Navy or something like that, this song has a tendency uh, to be played. And um, it, again, another song that the lyrics of the song have been on my heart all week, connecting with what the, the stories that we've uh, just heard Jamie read. And so I invite you in your worship spaces, uh, some of this, this, new, this song may be new to you, but I know there'll be many of you online this morning that uh, you've heard and, and sung along to this. It's a song by Lauren Daigle, and it's uh, simply called Rescue. Spirit of the living God, as we continue this journey with Luke, we pray that the words that Luke has recorded for us, these stories, would come alive, that they would come off the page, that they would not remain just mere words or stories but they would be transformative in our lives. Speak to us in our worship spaces, wherever we are this morning, in whatever frame of mind we're in, whatever's going on, speak your words of life and truth to us. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, after recording the calling of the first disciples, uh, Luke then records uh, his version of what we more commonly recall uh, as the Sermon on the Mount, right? But in Luke's gospel, it's really called the Sermon on the Plain. And Luke's uh, sermon begins, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Unlike Matthew, when you read the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's chapter 5, 6, and 7, Matthew's Beatitudes that begin the sermon, they kind of describe the character of a disciple. Look, apparently, focuses right in on lifestyle, life situation. And we shouldn't be surprised at that because we've, we've heard it a lot from Luke in these opening chapters of his gospel. He's talking to us about Jesus and, and showing us Jesus that has come to restore life to people. And, and we would be mistaken if we think that Luke is suggesting that this life is, is blessed in a worldly sense, because it's not, definitely not. Blessed are you who are poor. Woe to you who are rich. Why, why say that? 
Well, because it's easy, I think, for all of us to think that life is good or life is prospering, life is well, if we've got a lot of stuff, if we're getting richer, if our lives are becoming more full of what the world values as wealth and prosperity. The more you have, the better life you must be living. We should stop and think about that. How much does someone need, right? Think about it. How much does someone really need in order for their life to cross that line of blessedness, to finally get to that point where they say, yeah, life is now blessed? It sounds silly, doesn't it, really? Of course it's silly, because it's a worldly view of life, that somehow I need to get enough of that in order to become blessed. But the life that Jesus has been talking about, that He's been calling His disciples into, that He has come to restore in each and every one of us, is not a worldly, blessed life, but is a transformed life. It's a changed life. And as we have seen numerous times already in Luke, all of this idea of re restoration of life is directly connected with life together, with each other, this interrelatedness. And there should be no surprise that all of that interrelatedness has to be connected with our relationship vertically with Jesus. Hence, why Luke's opening section in his, in his Sermon on the Plain really could be summarized when you take the beginning, blessed are you and the end because of the Son of Man. That's where real blessing is to be found. Blessed are you because you are in relationship with the Son of Man. I've suggested that when Luke uses this term, the Son of Man, on the lips of Jesus, it's really we have got to keep thinking that Jesus is declaring Himself to be the true Adam. So, of course, we will be blessed if we are in relationship with the true Adam, because blessedness should be found in the life that God created all of us to live the way that Adam and Eve were supposed to be, the true Adam, the true Eve. So, let's be crystal clear. Luke's idea of this idea of being restored to life is because of a relationship with Jesus. Jesus is the heart of the good news that Luke is announcing to us. That's why in the next section of Luke, Luke chapter 7, 8, and 9, the major focus is Jesus. What better time of year to focus on Jesus than the number of weeks leading up to Easter that we call Lent? To introduce our journey uh, into Lent this year, uh, David Jennings had prepared the first daily devotional, and he also had sent an introduction to Lent. And uh, I quoted it in a recent newsletter. I also quoted it on Wednesday night at our midweek, because David uh, said that Lent uh, is an attempt to reveal habits or attitudes or sin that may be preventing us from experiencing wholeness, freedom, and flourishing. He says, of life as David's describing this, life in all of its fullness and abundance. And then David went on and he reflected on this idea of ordinary time. We, when the Christian calendar doesn't have these periods like Advent, Lent, Easter, Pentecost, right? We, we call it ordinary time, as if there's, well, there's, there's nothing really much to it. And David suggested we don't use the word ordinary, but the word ordinal. Never heard that before, and I thought it was brilliant. Ordinal in the sense of directions of a compass that guides guide one's path. Because, says David, the ultimate purpose is to guide all of us to commit to Jesus, to worship Jesus, to be more like Jesus. There's this real sense 
that we're on a journey. Whether it's ordinary time, whether it's Lent, we're constantly journeying to become more full of life, more focused on Jesus, to become transformed, to become more like Jesus. I love that idea. What better time to focus our hearts and lives through this Lent, through this seven-week period, than to be thinking it's all about us being in relationship with Jesus. So let's get into these two stories that Luke tells us today. Luke 7, verses 1 to 17. When Jesus had finished saying all this, when Jesus had finished saying the Sermon on the Plain, as recorded by Luke, um, to the people, and Luke adds, who were listening. Then he entered Capernaum. Luke throws it in, just a little phrase again, who were listening. He keeps hammering home this idea of people listening to Jesus. Right from the outset of this section that will become squarely focused on Jesus, on how important it is to look upon Jesus, yet again, we get reminded it's about listening. I said last week, discipleship is not about listening to words so much in order to learn the words, to be able to recite the words. Listening and discipleship is about learning so that we can live in accordance to that learning, to be transformed, to become more full of life, to, to become more like Jesus, as David reminded us in the introduction to our Lent. Luke then tells us about a centurion's servant who the centurion highly valued. A centurion. He was rich in a worldly sense. He had everything. He was very high up at the stratosphere, right, of society. And right from the outset of this focus on Jesus, we get told a centurion values, highly values the life of a servant. Life is of more value than all the stuff he had. It's like you want to kind of go, well, done, Mr. Centurion. You're beginning, you, you're the one that's beginning to see this. Next, the centurion hears about Jesus. Again, that idea, constant hammering by look, that there's this idea we must listen. And once we listen, we act upon what we've heard. The centurion heard about Jesus. So what did he do? Well, this is interesting, because if we think about it, the centurion should at that point summoned one of his servants to himself, right? Someone he had control over, command over, and used his authority and said, go, bring that man to me so I can gain something. Or at least take this that I have. Take this as an incentive to lure this rabbi to me to see if he can help, right? That's what you might think should be happening. What Luke tells us is the centurion asks the Jewish religious leaders to go to this Jewish rabbi and ask him, would he come and, quote, heal his servant? What a loaded phrase. The word heal used by Luke really means to deliver out of a dangerous situation or to bring safely through a difficult circumstance. What an interesting thing to ask Jewish leaders, right, independent of the centurion, to go and ask Jesus to heal, deliver his servant. They themselves represent Israel. They are the leaders of the Jewish faith. Israel, God's servant, they're the ones that need to be delivered. They're the ones who need to be brought safely through to be redeemed. But they don't connect the dots. They don't get it. They don't see who Jesus truly is. In fact, I'm not so, so sure they see anything in Jesus at all, except as a means that they could maybe gain from Jesus coming to this centurion. 
Jesus somehow has gathered up a bit of a reputation. And I think the religious leaders think, actually, if this guy could come and help, that would be better for us. Listen again what happens. They plead earnestly with Jesus. This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and he has built our synagogue. They plead earnestly. Why? Is it because they know the centurion has nothing whatsoever that he can possibly bring to give to lure Jesus to come and help? Obviously not. They are not pleading earnestly for the centurion's sake. They are pleading earnestly because they think they might gain something from this. This man loves Israel, our nation, and he's built us a synagogue. If you can help, what next might he build for us? Their pleading earnestly is not for the centurion, not for the centurion's servant, but for themselves. What can they get out of this situation? They argue that the centurion deserves Jesus to come and help. How did Luke introduce the Sermon on the Plain? What were the words again? Blessed are you who are poor. Blessed are you who have absolutely nothing whatsoever that you could possibly bring. You see, if you can bring something to the entrance into the kingdom of God, you may get that crazy idea that you deserved or that you've earned your entry into it. So blessed are you if you have nothing to bring. The man doesn't deserve. Jesus knows that. But Jesus goes because he knows that there's a teaching moment right here. Before he gets to the house, the centurion sends his own friends now to Jesus. Friends, again, he doesn't use his authority to demand that anybody goes. He asks his friends to go. And they take a message, Lord, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. There's nothing I have. Out of all the immense wealth that I have, there's nothing I could give you that would be adequate enough for me to deserve you to step foot in my house. Lauren Daigle's song, Rescue. Um, I love the, the bridge in the song. It's as if she's almost listening. And, and, and she, you know, she's lift, listening as if she is Jesus, if I can say it that way. And she can hear what the centurion's actually saying. And she records the words, I hear the whisper underneath your breath. I hear your whisper, you have nothing left. I don't deserve you to come under my roof. The centurion is, a, in, the, in a worldly sense, has, he's, got, he's rich. Let's face it. I argued last week, we're all rich living here in North Vancouver. But in the eyes of the kingdom of God, in relationship to Jesus, he realized he was poor, and blessed is he. And what he says next is truly, truly remarkable. Just say the word. Jesus, speak, because your word is more than enough. Luke says, what faith. Uh, Luke records Jesus saying, "What I have not seen faith like this. What incredible depth of theology. What an understanding of life that Jesus' word is more than sufficient to restore life. Think about that for a moment. We are living in a time right now, I think, where the majority of the world, us included, are desperate for vaccinations. Now, if you think about that, our hope for life is actually right now squarely in the hands of 
Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, and Johnson & Johnson. Now, I'm not going to suggest that Christians should just believe in the Word of God and not get vaccinated. Please don't hear that that's what I'm saying. I'm not suggesting that just by believing in the Word of God, somehow the church will overcome the pandemic of COVID. But right now, the world has its hope for life squarely in what these companies can do. Oh, to have as much hope and faith in the Word of God. Oh, to have the faith of the centurion, centurion that by following what Jesus says is enough to restore life, the life that we were created to be. To have that depth of faith in the Word, the Word that we have so readily available to us, that's sitting on shelves and bedside cabinets. To have that amount of faith that by delving into it, listening to it, understanding it, and living in accordance to it, will somehow restore life. Life, as David J. would say, life in all of its fullness and flourishing and abundance, that we would become more like Jesus. Soon afterward, Jesus then goes to a town called Nain, which interestingly is about six miles um, close to a, another town called Nazareth. So it's in the vicinity of Nazareth. Why might that be significant? As he approaches the town, he, is, he, and, he and his disciples see a funeral taking place, right? The only, and Luke describes the situation, the funerals for the only son of his mother who happens to be a widow, Right? Luke just kind of loads up a picture of what's going on in this woman's life. And when Jesus then sees her, notice that, not the dead son, but her, his heart went out to her and he spoke to her. Why? Well, we've seen this. There's been examples of this already in Luke. The story of the leper who uh, had no community connections because of his disease. The man with the shriveled hand who had no way of socially interacting or doing anything to earn a living because of his hand being his right hand being dead. And now we have a widow with only one son. That son is dead. She lives in a society that's highly stratified. There's no way now she can actually fend for herself. She has no hope for life in that community whatsoever. She, in one sense, is now the complete opposite to the centurion. In a worldly sense, she is. He had everything. He had all the riches probably anybody would need. But he realized that none of it was worth bringing before Jesus. And she, on the other hand, had absolutely nothing to bring. She is the opposite to him. And yet both of them receive blessing from Jesus. Jesus speaks. There's that focus on the Word again. He speaks not merely to raise the Son to life, but to restore Him back to His mother. That's why Luke tells us that little phrase. Did you hear that? Jesus gave Him back to His mother. He didn't just raise the Son to life. He gives Him back to His mother to restore the mother's life back, and she's now got hope for the future because she has a son. Now, here's the thing about these stories that Luke tells us. I think that Luke has put them here right after the Sermon on the Plain because he wants to illustrate this opening line, blessed are the poor. There's nothing that anyone can bring in order to be restored to life in Jesus. The life is a gift given unreservedly, undeservedly. The life is, of course, grace. But this life that Jesus has given is not given to one person so that that one person can be filled with life. The life that Jesus is giving and calling people to is a life together. The servant back with his centurion. The, the son back with his mother. 
the leper back into community. It's life that Jesus is calling us to is not to feed us with worldly blessings and riches so that we would have fat bank accounts. This life is life connected with each other and with Him. And here's the thing. The church, the elders, the religious folk in the story, they don't get it. Because their idea of blessedness is about them gaining from it if they can get something in return for Jesus doing something. Jesus, come help the centurion. He may build something more for us. We can keep him sweet. He will work for us. He'll do what we want. They don't get who Jesus is. They don't understand the life that Jesus is calling us to. Do you? Do, we, do I? Do we together? Do we really get who Jesus is? The people in the story apparently don't. At the end of the two stories, Luke says, and I quote, they think and they declare, a great prophet has, has appeared among us. God has come, what? To do what? To help his people. They think God has come to help them, to bless them, to raise them up, to give them more, because it's all about them. Haven't we seen this already in a story that happened in the vicinity of Nazareth when Jesus showed up? The hometown people thought he had come to bless them. If Jesus was merely a great prophet, if he's speaking God's word, and calling the people to help them. What do they need to do? They need to abide by his word. They would need to change. They would need to stop doing what they're doing. That's what prophets do. What happened the last time Jesus showed up in the vicinity of Nazareth and called the hometown people to change? They rejected it. Can you remember Luke chapter 4, verse 16 on? Can you remember the story that Jesus calls them to change, and then he uses two examples to emphasize that point. He quotes two Old Testament stories about two Old Testament great prophets. Remember? Elijah and Elisha. The story of Elijah was taken from 1 Kings 17. He tells Israel, you've been wicked. You need to change a famine is coming your way. And Elijah then gets sent to a place called Zarephath, and he meets a widow there. Do you remember that? He asks the widow for something to eat. She says she can't give it to him because she's making the last morsel of bread. She's got a little bit of water for her and her son, and then they will die. Elijah says, no, give it first to me. What does the widow do? She changes her mind. She does exactly what Elijah tells her to do, and her and her son live. She changes her mind. She follows the word spoken to her. Do you know what immediately happens after that story? Picking up the story of the widow, 1 Kings 17, verse 17. After this, after what I've just summarized, the son of the widow became ill. And his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. That's another way of saying he was dead. The widow's son dies. Now, does that sound like a familiar story to us? Following that, we're told Elijah takes the dead son. Picking up the story, verse 20, Elijah cries out to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourn by killing her son? Then he stretched himself out upon the child three times, and he cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, let the child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. And the life of the child came into him again, and he was revived. And Elijah took the child, brought him down from the upper chamber in the house, and delivered him back to his mother. And Elijah said, see, your son is alive. And the woman said to Elijah, quote, now I know that you are indeed a man of God, and that the word of the Lord is in your mouth, and it is truth. 
You hear the similarities with the story in Luke chapter 7? But not only did you hear the similarities, do you catch the differences? Elijah was a great prophet. And what did the great prophet do? He calls out to God for help, cries out to God. He lies upon the dead body himself, crying out to God to work through him. What does Jesus do when he encounters the widow's dead son? He himself goes over and puts his hand upon the bier, the coffin, and he speaks, get up. And the widow in Elijah, in the Elijah story, when her son is returned to, uh, to her, says, you are a man of God. You speak the word of the Lord. You speak truth. She acknowledges the truth in what Elijah has said to her. If she acknowledges the truth in Elijah's word, how much more is the truth in Jesus' word? Because he doesn't merely speak the word of the Lord. He is the word of the Lord. In Luke chapter 7, the centurion calls Jesus Lord. Luke describes Jesus as Lord when he enters into the story of the widow and the dead son. And yet the people around in the story call Jesus a great prophet. Do we know the difference? Luke told us in the Sermon on the Plain, Jesus asking the question, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? It's a real simple question, is it? If Jesus is Lord, do what he says. You can't pick and choose. Because you see, if he's a prophet, that's what you would do. Because when the prophet speaks, if it sounds good and it's going to be kind of blessing to you, you'll kind of go, oh, yeah, I like that, and receive it. But if he calls you to change, then you can so easily reject it. But we can't do that with Jesus. Because when Jesus speaks, everything spoken is truth. Everything that Jesus speaks is truth and is a calling to life. What are we going to do? What are you and I going to do with Jesus? Well, on Wednesday night, we started our journey through the seven letters to the churches in Asia Minor. The first letter is the church to Ephesus. And the heart of the story, ironically, is one's heart. Jesus sees the church. He can see their understanding, their Bible studies, the way they're learning all about him. They can see the amount of life and ministry that they're doing with their hands, and he, he commends them for it. But then he does an MRI scan of their hearts, and he says, but you have lost your first love. You've fallen from it. Your heart's empty of me. There's no relationship with me. You're not growing. You're not maturing in your faith, because I don't fill your heart because your heart's full of so many other things. You want life? Your heart needs to be filled with Jesus. Come, thy fount of every blessing. I think Nicola, when she was singing that song on Monday, I think it was one of those God moments. Because when I couldn't get the lyrics out of my head all week, and I looked at them, then I came across that third verse again. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter, like a chain. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord. There's the confession. There's the confession that all of us have just sung. Prone to wonder, Lord. All of us are. 
We're prone to fill our hearts with so many other things. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. So what do we do? Here's my heart. Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Bind my heart to yours. Fill my heart with you, Lord Jesus. Because you are the truth. You are life. Not what I think. Not the blessedness that I think I should have. But you. Jesus really is the center and the heart of the gospel. And when we read these two stories in Luke, I think Luke is challenging us to take stock on our journey and ask us what really is filling our hearts? What do we, who do we see in Jesus? Do we think Jesus is just a great teacher? But we can pick and choose what bits of his word Or do we come with open hearts and say, Lord, we need you to flush out everything that's in there. We want you to bind our hearts to you. Jesus, become the center of my life. On Wednesday night, we concluded the study in the letter. And um, about five minutes after I'd closed the Zoom call down, my uh, phone beeped. I kind of knew somebody must be texting me about um, what we did. Lo and behold, it was Nicola. And another song had come to her mind. And she was singing it, and I could hear her singing it. Jesus be the center. We conclude today in prayer with the words of that song. I invite you now in your worship spaces to reflect, to respond to what God has been saying to you as we sing, Jesus be the center.
Be the center. Be the reason I live. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the power and blessing and presence of the Holy Spirit be with us every moment, every day, forever. And all of God's people said together, amen. God bless you all. Um, it's been a privilege to be worshiping with you again this morning. God bless you in the week ahead. I look forward to seeing uh, some of you on uh, Wednesday night at our uh, midweek, and I'm sure Daniel will look forward to seeing some of you at the Bible study on Thursday morning. God bless. We'll see you next Sunday. And next Sunday, Todd, Pastor Todd Weed will be preaching as we continue our journey through Luke. God bless. <laughs>